So, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's talk by Milan Svoboda. I am Peter Jameson, and I'm chairman of the Friends of Czech Heritage. Milan has been a loyal supporter of the Friends for many years and has helped us in countless ways through his wide ranging network of contacts in the Czech world of heritage. After studying Russian, he did his community service at the state-owned historic chateau of Hosovsky Tin in Bohemia. From 1993 to 2001, he was the manager of the private chateau of the Lobkowitz of Ravnitsa at Nella Hodsvis near Prague, which is with its hugely important collections of paintings and musical scores, which were the first to be restituted to their former owners following the Velvet Revolution. From 2002 to 2008, he was the representative of the American Grand Circle Travel Organization and from 2009 to 2010, manager of the 100 plus state owned castles and chateaus in the care of the National Heritage Institute. Since 2011, he has been the representative of the Senec Travel Agency in the Czech Republic. And he is currently working on his PhD and teaching at the Institute of Ethnology at Charles University in Prague. His mouth-watering talk is on how did the Baroque taste with its vision of piled delicacies and overindulgence. I am fascinated. Milan, please tell us more. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, Peter. Thanks a lot for your uh, lovely introduction. Let's talk about how the Baroque taste. Now, uh, I want to start uh, to thank uh, first friends to give me a chance to give this talk. Uh, specifically, I want to thank to Jana, to Peter, to Dave, and to Stephen who have been in touch with me, and I am really grateful for all your support and help. Then I should uh, thank also to my colleagues because what I will be talking about, it wasn't done only by myself. Uh, I want to thank to two ladies. Uh, in a white sweater, it's Eva Boschkova, and the brownish lady in the brownish dress, it's Libusha Ruizova. They both my colleagues from National Heritage Institute. And I shouldn't forget to thank the property manager of Konopiště Chateau, Jana Sedláčková, uh, because she allowed me to give the lecture uh, just from the dining room when I sit right now, which is kind of the really uh, great um, honor to give the talk from here. So let's move on. Uh, my talk will have uh, three sections. First section will talk very briefly about historic dining and table setting, just to frame uh, the Konopiště Baroque table to a few historical circumstances. Uh, then I would like to introduce a little bit uh, the banqueting hall of Chateau of Konopiště, where I am right now. And uh, third section will be about uh, the table uh, which is set in a la Francaise style. Um, food, banquets, uh, feasts uh, was always part of any big ceremony. Could be wedding, could be uh, coronation, funeral, baptism. Um, of course, as you go deeper to the history, then less detailed information you get. And as you go closer to nowadays, nowadays uh, then the more specific details about menu, way of serving, uh, sitting order, etc., you get. Let's start uh, from the time where some kind of uh, uh, images, illuminations can be found in medieval codexes. Um, this is an uh, image from uh, year 1308. It's from the Archbishop Court in Trier, German town. And uh, here you can see that the banquet, uh, banquet guest being always elevated uh, a little bit higher on a higher stage uh, than other public. You can see this clearly because food was served 
by horses. So uh, the gas has been really, really high. And what you can see in the circle, uh, these are covers. I'm sure we all know glossies or food covers. Till now, they've been very common in these medieval ages uh, to deliver food warm on the table. Uh, from same codex, uh, another moment when the King Henry the Emperor, uh, Henry the Seventh, come from his coronation. Again, you see his table is uh, uh, elevated to be much more higher than the rest of the public and uh, members of court. Again, food is served by uh, on horses. I want to give you uh, details of a really fascinating banquet which happened 1378 in Paris. Uh, especially it's important for me as a being Czech because the main guest of the banquet was Czech King Charles IV in that time Emperor of Holy Roman Empire. Uh, 1378 is a year when Charles IV died. He died in November but in uh, January he decided to go to Paris because he grew up as a teenager in, in Paris, and he wanted to see uh, Paris one more time. Uh, when he arrived, actually he started the journey in the fall of 1377, and he arrived to Paris uh, in the beginning of January 1378. Uh, the banquet is very detailed documented, not only by such illuminations, but also uh, it is described in writing. Um, here you can see detail, you can see huge banquet table, actually banquet happened, banquet happened in several rooms. The gentleman in the red, that's the Charles IV, is the crown of the King of Holy Roman Empire. The gentleman in the middle is the host, French King Charles V, and gentleman uh, is the crown and gray dress. This is the son of Charles IV, future King Venceslav IV. But what's really appealing are the decorations on the banquet table. These uh, gilded um, these gilded ships, I was asking what they've been for, uh, and we think they've been for salt and for spices, which have been extremely expensive in the 14th century because they've been coming from Asia. But uh, we know exactly what was served. Food was coming in four courses, but don't imagine one course as the one meal. Each course had uh, 10 different dishes. Uh, Charles IV was badly sick, he could hardly walk, so host uh, eliminated third course uh, that his guest could survive such a long banquet a little bit, a little bit easier. But part of the banquet was also kind of entertainment from today's perspective. Uh, what you see on the right hand side, it's a kind of theater play. Uh, the guests from the banquet uh, table been watching a uh, play when the soldiers try to conquer uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem walls. Of course, the Charles IV was a uh, king of all Christians, so the theme really went very well with, the, uh, with his visit. And what's more, there was a real ship which was showing how uh, the soldiers been coming to the Jerusalem. So it was really opulent and luxury, luxury feast. You may know this lady, his name is Nadia Kubu. Uh, she is a wife of property manager of Karlstein Castle. And she was also helping to friends with the restoration of uh, 14th century Karlstein Gate, which is recently back in the castle, really uh, very well restored. And she, in 2016, when we celebrated 700 years of, uh, from, from the birth uh, of Charles IV, he decided to make reconstruction of this banquet in Paris 1378. And you can see she came really, really close. She even made these ships, uh, it's done from copper and it's gilded. And uh, you can see it now in the upper floors of Karlstein Royal Palace. Um, looking to this picture, I want to point out more. Um, one second. I want to point out more the cutlery. Uh, in medieval ages, what was uh, commonly used was a spoon, but then the knife, sharp knife, I brought one to show you, was used to pick up pieces of meat 
from the common plate which was lying on the on the table um, and the fork such a fork was used um, just to help waiters to distribute uh, meat on the table simply they didn't use a knife and fork as we do today but basically guests used to have only sharp knife uh, that's also why many many soldiers been around the banquet tables somehow to secure really valuable of position guests all the um, uh, visit paris visit of charles the fourth is uh, detailed recorded by this illumination illumination stored in bibliotheque nationale in paris uh, let's move on a uh, little bit further on to late Renaissance. This is a painting of um, Paolo Veronese showing first miracle of Jesus during the wedding in Cana of Galilee. Uh, it's a moment when he changed water to the red wine. Uh, but that's not the purpose why I want to show this to you. I want to show you the left corner. I made it bigger here. If you compare with the first images, which are quite schematic, you can see only plates, you can see something, some, some dishes on the table here already, 200 years later, you can see not only configuration of, of plates on, um, on the table, but you can see even what they eat, which kind of fruit. You can see even the red wine in these tata glasses. Uh, so it's an impressive painting and give us clear view how banquet table looked in Baroque, uh, in, sorry, in Renaissance, and you can see the ornamental configuration. Here is one really interesting detail. Actually, ladies and gentlemen, there are so many interesting banquets in European history, so it was very hard to choose a uh, few of them to give you some overview. The gentleman on the photograph is the French King Henry III. He visited Venice in 1574, and there was, he was there for seven days, seven days full of fascinating feasts. Um, one of uh, the official visits uh, brought him to Admirality uh, after the visit when he inspected all these uh, army ships, boats, uh, sweet refreshment was served. And the king tried to pick up the white napkin with his fingers. And once he touched it, the napkin fell to different parts because the napkin was made out of the white sugar. So this was really, uh, it is described like a funny moment, all the court was laughing to the king. And something very similar happened to English queen, Elizabeth I, when she visited 1564 Cambridge, and she's got these white cloths. And when we try to put them on the hand, they fell to the different parts because, to several parts, because then we also made out of the sugar. But the image, uh, or actually the cloths you see on the image uh, is, are done by Ivan Day. You may know the name, he is an English food historian uh, and we learned from him a lot. I dream to meet him one day and uh, to shake his hand because we will hear more about him as an uh, inspiration. Uh, here I would like to, I would like to show you one of banquets at uh, Prague, uh, imperial court. This uh, banquet happened 1585 in Prague Castle. Uh, you see on the left uh, Czech King and Roman Emperor uh, Rudolf II. You see again ornamental configuration of plates on the table, but I would like to talk more about the opposite side of the dining room. Uh, closer to you on this uh, buffet table, which are these steps covered by a green fabric. Uh, the gilded uh, dishes are ceremony, ceremonial dishes. They've never been used for dining. They've been only to show up in including this lovely boat uh, in the middle. But uh, I would like to talk about this table. Uh, table covered by white tablecloths was credence, uh, coming from Italian word credenza. And I'm sure you hear the English word credit or credential uh, in, in, in this name of piece of furniture. That's the place where food was tested for poison. 
Uh, actually, food was brought here from the kitchen or preparation room, uh, and it was tested by tasters. You can see one taster here on the fresco on the left. Actually, it wasn't tested the way that the taster will taste it. He gave the piece of food to dogs, and once the uh, dogs survived, uh, food could go uh, to the banquet, banquet table. What's interesting, it happened in front of eyes of all guests, that all guests are sure the food has a credit, uh, so that the credence name comes from. But they've been also different ways of testing uh, food for poison, more mystical ways. Uh, the little tree you see on the right, uh, those objects hanging on it are uh, petrified uh, tooth, no, petrified teeth of uh, Paleolithic shark. Uh, you can see them down, down here. And uh, tasters believe when they uh, put them, dip them to the wine and they change color or they start whatever else can, can happen, so they can test if the wine is uh, fine or not. There was one more very interesting way how to test uh, food for poison. Uh, medieval uh, tasters believe there is something what called stone uh, of toad, toad stone. We know that toad has no stone in the head. Actually, uh, they found petrified uh, teeth of uh, sharks, I mentioned already, you can see them on the right. And uh, actually that's the uh, petrified mouth of the, of the shark. And they thought it's, uh, or they thought, uh, they created legend, it's a stone from toad's head. What's really interesting, you can find these, these uh, shark's teeth in very valuable jewel, jewels. For example, you can see on the left, right, they are located on the crown of Roman, Holy Roman Empire king stored in Aachen. So why? Because uh, in medieval time, people believe they have a protective effects, also healing and curative effects. Um, and a few days ago uh, was published that in, uh, we have such a shark piece also a tooth one uh, in Bohemia. You may know we have in Betchov, Nateplo, the really famous, famous castle, uh, Shar, uh, shrine of San Maurus, and you see uh, one stone wasn't stone. They actually a couple of days ago took it out and studied it, and they realized it's a, not a stone. It's a real, really petrified tooth of shark. Uh, I was in Bechov on 14th of uh, June when uh, one paleontologist uh, came to study it, so I was present. And I had a really interesting talk with her about uh, using these stones for testing poison. Uh, let's forget about poisoning. Uh, let's uh, go to England. Uh, the image you see uh, comes from uh, coronation banquet of English King James II, uh, which happened in 1685. And here we are already in Baroque era. You can see the ornamental setting. You can see on the side of the table little platters uh, for uh, individual guests. You can see these knives again, little glasses for liquor. Uh, on the opposite side, you see how people been helping themselves. They've been really taking uh, food from these big platters and um, they've been a huge amount of dishes cooked for this uh, banquet. It was 1145 meals for dishes. Uh, let me tell you a few words about this service à la française style. Um, service à la française means that food is served in decorative way, ornamental way. Uh, image you see is from the cookbook of English uh, cook and housekeeper uh, Elizabeth Raphael, uh, about 1760. You clearly see the ornamental setting of the table. But what's more, she described even what will be served on each platter. 
uh, have a look. In the middle, the center of the table is transparent pudding covered with the silver web. Uh, down here, you can see macaroni on the right hand, right down corner, stewed mushrooms. Uh, so not only plates made the ornament, but also the food was served uh, as a piece of art. You can clearly see on this image from movie Vatel, I will talk about Francois Vatel in the second. You see in Renaissance ornament was only two dimensional. In Baroque, it getting third sort of dimension. It goes all up um, uh, vertically. And uh, they made pyramids from food, fruit, uh, flowers. It was really most opulent time for dining. Uh, this is interesting photographs from the from the movie uh, Marie Antoinette. Uh, on the right, you see um, the meat pie. Then a little bit to the left, you see uh, orange jelly. And in the center of the table, in the silver platter on the gilded centerpiece, you see roasted poultry. These are uh, quails. Do I say this correctly? Uh, what's more, not only roasted, also stuffed that makes it really decorative. And this, this table is again uh, done by Ivan Day. And uh, this was real inspiration for our table in Onopistia. We took his idea about folding napkins to these little weights uh, to use uh, white, blue, probably wood, pottery, and also these whatnots, which makes the uh, vertical decorations you will see here in Konopiště. And here is the Ivan, Ivan Day. Uh, before I move to Konopiště, I would like to give you one really interesting story, which is, which is connected to what you see on the table here. It's a France, 1662. Uh, maybe you know this chateau called uh, vaux le was built by Minister of Finances of uh, French King Louis XIV. Uh, it's a brand new palace, and uh, a king is invited for feast uh, in August 1662. Uh, all the feast was organized by butler called Francois Vatel. Uh, it was fascinating event. Um, banquet was served uh, with five courses, each course 25 meals in total 125 different dishes. Uh, court members got it in five sections. So first course, second course, third course, etc. King arrived to one huge hall and for him 125 dishes were served at once. He was so impressed that next day he put Nicolas Fouquet to the jail and he never came out. Simply King was jealous and he took all the architects and uh, and he built his Versailles. Vatel should escape as well to England. And after 10 years, he came back to France and he was working from Prince uh, de Condé. Uh, what's so famous on a la Francaise style? As these vertical pyramids made out of fruit, made out of pastry. Uh, and I should say a few words about another style of dining a la Riz style. It's coming a little bit later on, beginning of 19th century after Napoleon Wars. Simply, uh, Napoleon Wars damaged Europe the way that no aristocratic court afford to produce such opulent uh, dinners and banquets. Uh, actually, a la Riz means Russian way, because Russia used this style of dining, which I will be talking about, um, already in 18th century. What happened? 1810, uh, Russian ambassador Kurakin uh, invited a group of diplomats to Russian embassy and they've been shocked. They haven't found pyramids of food. Uh, no food on the table, actually. They found each person own seat. Uh, each person in, in, in front of each person set of glasses. Uh, during a la Francaise style, no glasses on the table. Servant comes to you once you want to drink, brings a glass, you drink, 
and then the servant takes the glass out of the banquet table. Here, all of a sudden, set of glasses, set of carats, a uh, set of cutlery, silverware. Uh, this No one see this before in, in Paris. Uh, actually, set menu was served and uh, variety of glasses and silverware follows the uh, set menu which will be served. You can see these images are from Hofburg. Everything should line up in Alaris style because this is how it should look like. Some of you saw Alaris table uh, during our Chateau of Kinswart visit in the fall of 2018. Um, and now about the hall I am sitting in, about the banqueting hall or dining room of Chateau of Konopiště. Uh, we all know Konopiště as a 19th century uh, family seat of Francis Ferdinand Este, heir of the uh, throne of austro hungary But originally in 13th century, uh, Konopiště was actually a medieval fortress, fortified castle. Um, uh, here used to be many, many, many owners. Let me talk, now here is the visualization of, of the medieval fortress. But let me talk about the family which bought Konopiště in 17th century because uh, it's related to the table I'm sitting next to. Their name was Vrdba, very typical Czech name and very difficult for foreigners. But uh, you see the shape of Konopiště during their times. Basically, they made a baroque residence. They created from Konopiště baroque residence. You see, this is a current uh, image of Konopiště, and it didn't change much till now. Um, the room I am sitting in uh, used to be the main hall uh, of the of the chateau, and here I should say that the uh, chateau was family seat of Ferdinand Este till 1921. He was killed in Sarajevo 1914, but his children owned it till 1925 by uh, 1921 when it was confiscated by Czech state. Uh, very soon, uh, Chateau was open for public. Uh, during Second World War, uh, Gestapo used to be here. And after 1945, Castle was again open to the public. So you see on photographs from 1950, approximately, all furniture was moved to the side to give the access to these thousands and thousands of visitors who've been visiting this place. Actually, Konopiště is still now one of most visited places. Uh, these color photographs are from 80s. I remember Konopiště as a child like this, but still you see furniture is moved, including table, to the side. Actually, this doesn't produce feeling. This is a dining room. And we've got a chance in the Christmas 2018 to put the table to the center of the room just under the chandelier. And I believe you feel the difference. All of a sudden, it's a real dining room. Uh, we prepared the uh, Christmas dinner. Actually, it wasn't really Christmas dinner. Uh, Ferdinand Deste Archduke, Ferdinand Deste was born 18th, 18th of December. Uh, and uh, he always had a kind of anniversary celebration here. So this is for his first day. Uh, then we've done in the next spring kind of Easter exhibition and in the fall hunting banquet table. What's interesting, I managed to borrow uh, this, this uniform, uh, including orders and sword. It was quite impressive to have it in my hands and uh, I've done some exhibition in the summer 2019 at the Blatna Castle. Some of you may know the place of Blatna. We've been locked in with the group of friends in, we couldn't get out. <laughs> um, and let's talk now about, specifically about the banqueting table in Konopiště. Our inspiration, I should frankly say, we've been inspired by National Trust Houses. Uh, I will name only, only one. This is the Kettleston Hall which has an intact uh, exhibition since 18th century. 
The only difference is that um, in many cases, uh, your banquet tables are without white tablecloths. You're dining on the desk. We, we don't do this uh, in continental Europe. Second inspiration, Ivan Day again. This is quite interesting movie I saw a while ago when Ivan Day presenting exactly what, what you, I have now in Konopiště. Last course of the banquet, sweet dessert table. In this case, it's a sweet table from Shakespeare times. And Ivan Day says, I made it the way that I believe when Shakespeare stepped in, he would recognize this is the food from his time. Um, Ivan Day done one more very interesting exhibition, actually very recently in 2020, uh, in Cambridge, there was an uh, exhibition called Feast and Fast. And he's done this fascinating banqueting table with all what you see is made out of the sugar, including the plates holding, holding the sweets. And you can see the gloves I was talking about uh, on the down right corner. Uh, another inspiration we've been looking for in iconography means paintings, prints, drawings, watercolors. This is a very famous painting of uh, French painter Troy uh, showing lunch with oysters. Uh, and I show this image because here the idea came to make an elliptic table. Uh, till now, Konopiště had in dining only square little table, but we decided to make a massive four and a half meters long elliptic table. I've seen same table in the movie Farinelli il Castrato. It's a very old movie about famous Castrato, uh, made 1994. But uh, when I studied the image, uh, visibly the director studied exactly how the Ala Frances style should look like, including musicians, including servants, uh, including people opening the uh, oysters, including coolers on the left and right side. So visibly this movie was very precise in showing uh, uh, dining à la Francaise style. Another inspiration was a book from 1698 uh, written by uh, François Massialo. He was a chef of brother of Louis XIV, uh, Prince Philippe uh, from of Orléans. And uh, this was so famous book of recipes uh, which was printed several times. And in the version of 1715, Marcello added several prints. And one of them uh, I am showing you on the screen. Uh, and Marcello uh, very specifically describes in detail what should be put on each plate. What's dry fruits? What's real fruit? What's, uh, which kind of flowers? Which kind of cheese, jelly, uh, etc. So it's in, written in old French language. So I found a colleague of mine who knows, it's not that difficult to read it actually. And she made a translation for me and we tried to set the table exactly uh, by this print. But what's more, you can see this uh, vertical pyramids, not only on the Baroque table, but also for example, in Baroque garden of uh, Versailles, or we have uh, this kind of desserts, I will be talking about them a little bit later on. This comes from Metropolitan Museum uh, in New York. Another inspiration, friend of mine, property manager of Chesky Krumlov uh, Castle. Some of you know it as well. Actually, he is the only one who created a real Baroque table based on scientific uh, researches. Um, in the middle, the peacock, this is, this is a very common question, how they ate the peacock, how they could eat the feathers. They never touch it. it it's called Schau Essen, which in translation means food only for display. Uh, and also sim symbol of uh, peacock is the richness, beauty, and also Jesus Christ. They say that meat of peacock is so tough that you can't eat it. So basically it's a meat which cannot uh, get damaged. That's the link between Jesus who never dies. But what's more about Chesky Krumlo? Would you believe 
that this guy, property manager Pavel Slavko, making not only exhibitions, uh, this kind of uh, artificial food, but he makes real banquets. Uh, what you see, it's real food made uh, by Baroque recipes. I dream to have a chance to, to do such a thing once in my life. And you can see oysters. By the way, I was teaching my students uh, how to eat oysters. This was a big fun. <laughs> and another inspiration was Giacomo Casanova. Uh, you may know, I'm sure you know the name. He was a kind of traveler, cavalier. He traveled around the Europe. He loved the food and wine. And a uh, friend of mine, Karel Holub, who, read, who wrote a book I'm showing you on the left, uh, translated to check all his memoirs. Fascinating, uh, fascinating text. Uh, just uh, one idea coming to my mind. The, the summer residence I'm showing you, uh, it's in Brühl, which is a German time north uh, from Bohemia. And he was invited once for a feast. And he described very detailed how the feast went on. I thought before that uh, banquet was banquet was kind of the event with um, calm guests, clean tablecloths. No one was really much talking. Nonsense. It was a huge fun. He says after twenty bottles of champagne, everyone was laughing, talking to each other. So uh, I think it was really. Uh, they had a really good time. So Casanova was another, another inspiration. Now, what was available to uh, create Baroque table? Frankly say, you cannot find any uh, dishes coming from 18th century. Everything is gone. Uh, you, can, you cannot find sets at all. You can find fragments like one, two, two plates. Uh, family who owned the Konopiške, the Sprdba family, uh, established 1792 uh, manufacture for pottery and for sure they've been inspired by English wedgewood. On the left, Czech production. On the right, you see uh, wedgewood production. Uh, this, pl this plate on the left is from 1830. It's not 18th century. And this is how it looks on the banqueting table here in Konopiške. Here, I just want to point out, do you notice that the silverware is gilded in the end? There is a reason, because it's a dessert. Dessert cutlery uh, also can be used for fruits. For fruits. Um, if it will be silver, it will uh, basically be damaged by the juice of fruits and should be cleaned very often. The gilded part uh, actually survives much, much better. Here are other plates we used. What's really interesting, uh, you will see a little bit later on, each plate on our Baroque table in Konopiště is different. And it really doesn't damage the complex look of the banqueting table. Uh, plate on the left, this is the only plate from 18th century, which is uh, here in Konopiště, 1750 from, German, from Germany. But I really like uh, the square plate on the right. And this was done 1830, but I believe you agree with me. This is really contemporary kind of decoration. Uh, then I mentioned champagne. Champagne was always cooled in the banqueting room. Uh, funny enough, these uh, coolers are. Uh, where they are. Uh, people very often see these are pots for plants and they put plants to it. These are 16th and 17th century coolers. Very, today, very valuable objects. Uh, the upper one is from Konopiste. I put down one from Upper Hungary, Slovakia, today. By this, we know they are from the same age, which is 16th and 17th century. Uh, I bought all old bottles of champagne and uh, we cool the champagne in the dining room. You can see uh, the cooler also in this fascinating painting of uh, banqueting uh, monkeys and cats. Gentlemen as a monkeys, ladies as a cats. 
this is a painting uh, which I used to have in the collection in Elahoze West Castle when I was a property manager many, many years ago. Fascinating painting. And now, coming back to the print of Francois Marcello, uh, what was our inspiration? As you can see, each such a banqueting table should have a really heavy centerpiece. Here, the center is created by two round plates and octagon in the middle. We didn't have anything like this, so we've been looking something what can create an uh, interesting, interesting centerpiece. And we found this in collection uh, of Prince Metternich in Chateau of Kinjva. This uh, bronze gilded piece, some of you again saw it during our visit uh, of Kinjvat in 2018, is done from three sections. Um, it's uh, gilded and we borrowed all the complex of uh, Plat de Ménage, which is the uh, flat piece, and the statues and tatsa, tatsas uh, with the fruits. Here you can see actually how it can be uh, put in the parts and collected back. What's interesting, this is 200 years old and maybe more. And just you can connect it so easily. It's done such a perfect way. And what I really like that uh, the blood de menage sits on the backs of six artists. And I will be talking very soon about this coat of art, which you can see on the uh, right down corner. Uh, what's really interesting, we have no evidence how Metternich has got this piece of uh, uh, this, this artifact. Uh, there is no, he brought it from Brussels, uh, 1851. Uh, Metternich was, was in exile, uh, 1848, 1851, uh, on, uh, in, in, in England. And uh, colleagues of mine, I showed them to you in the beginning of my talk, uh, they really try to research uh, what this coat of arms is about. And very soon they found it's a very old Scottish family, Cunningham clan. They live till now. Um, they have a very interesting motto, over fork over, because the ancient member of the family help the Prince Malcolm III uh, to survive by putting hay on him by fork. And this Ypsilon, that's the fork. Uh, very interesting to go to such a details. Uh, we ask for help many institutions in England, including National Trust, Ettingen Trust. And Ettingen Trust Connect Me is the um, association called the Goldsmiths Company in London. And they really helped me to find out exact family branch who owned this piece of art and they still live in Slane Castle in Ireland. So we already sent the letter and we would love to go to visit them to find out how come this piece coming from Scotland or Ireland end up with Metternich in Brussels and later on in Austria. Uh, how to prove it's, it's coming from England? Oh, there is one more thing, the Tudor rose. Uh, plenty of these roses uh, surrounding uh, the, the piece. So I am confident this is this coming from UK. And here you see our way how we decorated the centerpiece. It is really a piece. By the way, it's fascinating to have it in your hands. It's heavy, it's very hard to put it on such a big table, but uh, you are honored to touch it and to put it together and decorate it. Also, I was moved when I was working. And how it was done, actually. So that's the result. You see what we've created in, uh, in the dining room. Actually, you can see it behind me, but it wasn't easy. First, we should make a table four and a half meters long and two and, mat, two and a half meters uh, high. I, because I never did it, I decided to put it to my bedroom before we move it to Konopiště. And you see that we try to play around and my, made, make kind of the model uh, for better imagination because I didn't want to end up 
I come to Konopis jail, it will not work. Uh, one day we should move, it was during the pandemic, so we should move uh, table to Konopis because we had a restriction to move um, from my town. It was impossible to move. Uh, and then I should put the desk actually on the floor and I was drawing on papers which kind of dessert, which, uh, which sweets we put, we put where. Uh, here you can see it on my uh, in my place, and here you see it in Konopiště. So I am really pleased. I've done the exercise because I wasn't surprised when I saw it on on the table. It was a very interesting moment to see it fully decorated here uh, in the dining room. We faced another issue. I was talking about this pyramidal decoration, pyramids of fruits. The, you can see the result, but before we came there, it was a very painful story. We, on the left, you can see we really tried to make a pyramid, but during pandemic, we could not really go to shop the artificial fruit. Uh, on the right, you see how it should look, should look like. On the left, you see it didn't really look well. And in that time, I was watching a movie about uh, Empress... Catherine the Great in Russia. Look, I've seen they used whatnots. So that was the idea. We don't need to make a pyramid. In 18th century already, uh, they used whatnots. And I asked uh, uh, our main porcelain uh, manufacturer called Toon. Uh, it exists from 19th century. And I pushed them to gild the white porcelain, whatnot. Look, it looks really appealing. And when you put the fruit on it, it looks like a piece of butter. Actually, when you see it on the table, you wouldn't see the difference between historic centerpiece and this modern gilded piece of ordinary China. And that's the result. I'm proud. <laughs> uh, this image isn't really nice. But believe me, it's very difficult to take a photograph of such a wide table in a relatively small dining room. But I put it here to show you that we try to come really close uh, to the pattern, to the print from Marcelo from 1715. Um, it could be better, but we came as close as we could come. Uh, in the center of the table, there is a, another uh, what not from. Metternich's collection topped by pineapple. Actually, pineapple has been um, uh, grown in this area in greenhouses already in the middle of 18th century. And it was really kind of aristocratic fruit. And it shouldn't, any banquet, should, every banquet should have a, a pineapple on the table. And the lower part was, um, uh, we, we put on the lower part, these kind of citruses uh, in Italian cedro. Uh, is it cedar in English? Kind of the very big lemon with very specific taste, very expensive because it's grown only in Sicily. So imagine how long it would take uh, to bring it from Sicily here and season of, of this fruit ending up in April. So basically uh, this was here during the Christmas time or uh, such a time of the year. And uh, these uh, fruits look like real, but they are made out of the sugar. But here you see the real one. We bought in April the real ones. And basically, you don't see much the difference. My colleagues, the ladies, have a gilded uh, hands. They can do really miracles. And that's the whatnot uh, in the time. Uh, that's the view which uh, visitors getting when they enter in uh, the dining room. I think they are pretty impressed. They don't expect so many gilded uh, pieces and so dynamic uh, uh, table in the middle of the room. Uh, now I would like to tell you a few words about the sweets which we put on the table. Actually, every sweet is real. We studied Ivan Day's books. Uh, we studied other iconography, some Czech recipes, um, and this is how we done. 
there are no our inventions. Everything really exists. Let's start from the left on this bigger plate. You see round cookies. These are not cookies, these are macarons. Because if you, I found the really 19th century recipe in English, thank you, God. Uh, and then I found also this uh, painting. You see macaron coming from Italy because first it was made, uh, the dough was made from macarons. Later it was made from almonds. But they've been a single ones. We know macarons now, they uh, glued together by kind of stuffing. But originally it was only single round cookie or the long cookie. Uh, I found another French recipe um, and we tried to make it. And this is on the table. So I think we came really close, but I tell you the secret. Uh, macarons should be done today from almonds and whites of the egg. It didn't work. So what you see on the left and what's lie on the table, it's made from coconut. <laughs> well, it looks like a, like a macaron. Uh, another instrument we used are these molds coming guess from where? from England. I bought them uh, via eBay in London. Uh, I have a collection already from 20 of these molds. They can be used for ice cream sorbet or marzipan sweet. Um, it's not really easy to make uh, sugar or marzipan uh, sweet from the metal mold. So we made a uh, kind of silicone or rubber ones, rubber copies, and we created our marzipan sweet. Uh, again, here is an inspiration of Ivan Day. What I really like on him, he has a very good English humor. So on his exhibition, you always find something fun. So we found on his exhibition, gilded fish floating on the sweet jelly. So we made, we didn't have a mold for fish. So we, we made crawfish floating on the sweet gelatinous So we've been heavily inspired by England. I really love eating cards so you can play and later on you can eat. <laughs> Again, inspiration coming from Ivan Day. And here how we made the cards. This is stuffed marzipan. Marzipan was famous from ancient time. Uh, it, ca it came from Asia, you know, it's a actually, almond mixed with sugar. Um, this was kind of um, more sophisticated way how to eat marzipan. You cannot eat much because it's very heavy. Uh, so you fill it by kind of controversial stuffing. For example, uh, marzipan looking like lemon, when you cut it, you find chili stuffing in it. So the controversial taste. Um, this idea is uh, surviving till today. There is a guy called Cédric Grolet. He's a French, one of the top world a sweet chefs. He has two shops in uh, Opera in Paris, and he making a sweet which looks like real fruit. But when you cut it, you, you get the filling. This is his fig. This is our, from our mold. <laughs> um, we also make these little pineapples, and here you see figs and strawberries. Uh, the sweets, the little cakes on the right are sold in museum shop in Versailles. So we made our version on the left with edible gold. And uh, these are candy cherries by Ivan Day, candy cherries by us and on the table. Actually, the pyramid you see behind, this is again, show us food only for display, made out of the sugar, decorated by edible gold. Uh, walnuts, again, on the left, uh, uh, Ivan Day production, on the right, Cédric Grolet, and these are ours. Uh, mandarins, Cédric Grolet and ours. We are really close, right? And uh, marzipan cake, something but uh, you shouldn't miss on the banquet table. Inside would be cake, whichever the uh, host wants covered by uh, lovely marzipan. And jelly, very famous in England. Um, you can do variety of, we had an apple jelly, apple jelly, <coughs> excuse me. 
and the territory. And then the napkin. Uh, if you remember the image I showed you a few minutes ago, again, Ivan Day was our inspiration. These little waves makes it really, really appealing. Here is the image of Ivan Day. Well, frankly, it was a half year or uh, of research, of trying to make things. things. Uh, we spent really six months before we came to Konopiště with everything and we set it in the dining room. It was quite difficult task, but quite interesting. I am really thrilled I, I could invent it from the first idea to the realization. And here is again another view. We've been hanged uh, on the ceiling to take this photograph. So how did the Baroque taste? Actually, um, there was a really interesting exhibition uh, in Metropolitan Museum in New York called Visit to Versailles. Actually, I didn't know Versailles was publicly accessible. If you, if you were well-dressed, you could get inside to see collections, to see the king. Um, and uh, this uh, exhibition actually was explaining. And uh, I am sure you know Jonat Otolenghi. He is an English chef based in London, uh, who was hired by the Met Metropolitan Museum in New York for the opening party. And his task was to collect sweet chefs around the world and to let them make cakes inspired by uh, Louis XIV time. Uh, and he's done it. And that's my dream. I try to do it. Of course, I am not Otolenghi and I am not Metropolitan Museum in New York. But also the pandemic uh, drives us crazy because basically we could not run uh, any special events, really. Uh, but I've uh, done twice this little tasting. You can see marzipan crawfish topped with strawberries. And uh, the white is a whipped cream called creme chantilly. That's the invention of Francois Vatel, the butler of... Um, um, Nicolas Fouquet. Uh, it's a whipped cream flavored by vanilla uh, and flavored by a little bit of cognac. Uh, really tasty. You should you shouldn't put much of sugar in it. Only only a little. Bit. Uh, and I have a dream. We have a Czech sweet chef, this lady, and she is she is doing same thing as Cedric Grolet. So I don't need to go to Paris to bring these kind of sweets here. And I, over, I am already in touch with her and I, I want to make next year event that we really have a Baroque feast in this room uh, with the suites, which looks like from Baroque time. Actually, there was a closure of this season and I was invited by the property manager and I brought, uh, yeah, here I can show you. I, I got the recipe to make uh, historical ice creams and sorbets. Actually, on the right, you see the historic uh, sorbetier, which I bought again, guess where, in England. <laughs> eBay is a great place to buy things. And I can really produce historical sorbets. I, I took my students, you see me in the middle, talking to my students. Uh, and I was invited for this event in the end of the season. I brought lemon sorbet with champagne, with few drops of bergamot oil. It had a, a huge success. I dream one day you taste my sorbet. That's the sorbet. It looks really appealing, but I can make also, for example, such a pineapple ice cream. And that's from the old mold, which I bought again in England. <laughs> I try to make also jelly. I'm sure you, you know such a, such a mold. I am not good in it yet. When I make it, it's um, losing the shape. I should train, train more. Uh, if you will be interested, I've got this, actually it's an Ivan Day recipe, but I got it from his pupil, who is a German guy, uh, and the recipe works uh, pretty well. I am sure I can distribute it via our chairman or, or Jana or Stephen or Day. And the last thing I try to teach now in Charles University, uh, good manners or good table manners, these are my students in my place. You see the Baroque uh, centerpiece in the, in the middle. And it's a huge fun 
to see these young guys and uh, girls trying to hold the forks and knife properly eating we, we i try to teach them to eat uh, difficult uh, meals where uh, oysters uh, shrimps by hands uh, pasta fascinating event so i i have a really fun now and my last dream you know all these banquets are actually shown to public just before the banquet start uh, I found it a little bit boring. I dream once to make a banquet table in the shape in the end of the banquet. So something like this to see what's left on the table. Uh, this is these whatnots. Look, this is a 19th century French work fascinating again i want to point out it's 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 great to touch it and work work with it um then here is the show essen pyramid with edible with edible gold i'm back so this is really three levels cake uh topped by edible gold and here is the liquor glasses as i explained the servant goes to the banquet table then you you drink and then servants move it back. And as the last shot, I would like to show you the live view of the table. Actually, that's the ornamental, ornamental à la Francaise table in a Konopistien. Well, I'm, oh, I may be the cards. I really love these. Are, I can eat it, but it's here for half year already, so it's not really edible anymore. And here is the, the crawfish floating in the, in the jelly. And the last view. Honestly, I am honored to be able to work with all these objects and to make it in this exhibition. Uh, here I am back. I would like to thank you for your attention, for the possibility to talk about my my passion and uh, you, God knows, you know, you, you may come one day to Konopiště to see Barok and maybe you can also taste the Barok. Thank you very much. Well, Milan, thank you very much indeed. Um, um, I don't think I need any supper tonight. Or at least maybe <laughs> I do. But, but this was the intention. <laughs> I'm afraid it's not, it's not going to include any of, anything like that, which is a great pity. Uh, I've, uh, I found that absolutely fascinating. Um, and um, I think you'll have to, uh, uh, we'll have to have a gourmet um, trip to, um, to the Czech Republic and go around uh, sampling th these things at various important houses and I'm sure you can lay it on for us. I think it would be an ex excellent. Um, I don't have any particular questions. I mean, I could go on making observations, but I, I suppose I think what is it, one of the interesting things that you've been talking about latterly is that this is, we've been talking about um, sort of sweet refreshments um, mm -hmm. and the way that I'm not quite clear how they would have related to the um, uh, savory um, part of the meal, whether they would have been a totally separate uh, something that you did later in the evening or um, whatever. I, I'm not quite. Just yeah. uh, this is that. quite co really quite discussable topic. Uh, as I understand this, um, banquet was a long social event. It took several, actually many many hours. Uh, and it could be done also different ways. Casanova, for example, uh, talks in his memoirs that they move or switch tables somewhere else. Uh, but in the same time, when it is a ceremony, the meals, the savory and salty meals coming in sections. So basically you come, you sit on uh, behind the table and servants bring the food. Then they move the food out and brings another course and it goes back and forth. This is very different from the uh, a la risque style, when basically you get served each dish uh, by, by waiters and you get it on your, on your plate, like in the restaurant. 
So that's the difference between Ala Frances. Also, I want to say, and thank you, Peter, for this question. I think all this vary uh, because of the owner of the place, of the host, of their wish, of the occasion. I think we try to make a very strict rules where the rules doesn't exist. Same like you dining some way, I dining different way. When you're visiting my house, you follow my rules. Uh, I believe coronation has a strict etiquette and, and rules, but the banquet with 20 bottles of champagne, it's a uh, your fun. So there will be different occasions will give different setups. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, I suppose as the as the wine flowed, things began to exactly. sort of um, <laughs> rather start to fall apart rather pleasantly. <laughs> um, um, I I think it leaves me to thank Milan hugely for all the time he's put into this presentation, and and I think we're very very grateful. It's marvelous sort of evocation of the. Uh, of, of a life that others might have led, but not, not ourselves, unfortunately. Anyhow, Milan, thank you very much indeed. And um, uh, it's been recorded, so we will send it out to, and hope that everybody will um, pick it up again. Thanks very much indeed. We're thank you very much Would and have a nice unmute, evening. Please unmute and, and uh, give Milan a, a, a clap, will you please? Oh, thank you, thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you very much. Regards to England and have a lovely yes. evening. We will Take be care. in touch. Thank you very bye much. Bye. Right. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.